Hi, this is Sergei Kalinets from Polymatch Tech, and today I want to talk about the improvements in .NET related to microservices development. I've been working with .NET since the very beginning, and I always uh, was thinking that the .NET is very verbose. If you take, for example, Node.js, then the Hello World will look like this. Just one file, couple of lines of code, and you get a working verb service. The same is true for Python. Again, one file and also a couple of lines, and the result is the same, a working verb service. But if you try to do the Hello World exercise with the classic .NET framework, ISP.NET, maybe a couple of years ago, you would probably end up with the project and a bunch of files in it and a lot of code, a lot of XML stuff, a lot of c -sharp stuff, just to get some simple Hello World experience. Of course, this sample uh, is slightly exaggerated because uh, in this particular case you will get much more than in simple Python and Node.js code that I showed you before that. However, in general, C Sharp and .NET are still more verbose than we uh, would like it to be. And a uh, few years ago, it was not so uncommon to meet such questions on Stack Overflow. What should I do if my solution has uh, tens or maybe hundreds of projects and my computer cannot compile them and my Visual Studio is dying actually when it tries to do it. So people in .NET were struggling a lot of verbosity in their in they code and they tried to find a solution. And until... But with introduction of .NET Core, Microsoft took very promising direction in the evolution of .NET. The first step was moving from Windows to non-Windows, to Linux and so on. And with the release of .NET 6, next major improvements uh, appeared. And these are improvements that I would like to talk in this uh, session. These basically are top-level statements and minimal IPs. And both allows us to write less code, getting very cool experience. First is top-level statement. This is basically how currently the program CS file looks like, and this is the hello world stuff. So you, you would need to create only one file, and you need to put only one line of code there. Of course, you also need the project file, but this is uh, for now inevitable. Maybe in some future releases they will make it optional as well. But right now, you basically need just two files. One is project file, one is uh, program CS file with only one line of code, and it will just compile. And when executed, it will write the message to the console. Before, we needed to create a program class with the static main method. Also, we needed to put some using for system. And currently, we just need only one uh, line of this. So it's like we are developing only one method main without basically uh, declaring it. The next step in that direction is minimal API. 
This is improvement added to ISP.NET Core that allows us to write less code, not to create controllers, roles and so on, and even not to create a startup CS file, but still developing a single program CS using the top level statements and declare all the functionality that we need for our microservices. The list of functionality is available here. If you download uh, slides, you can basically click on each of these to get more details. And below is the link from the official documentation of Microsoft. And that shows you how to implement each of these features in the minimal IP stuff. However, we are not going to read the documentation right here. Instead, we will take a look at some simple demo project that I created to highlight the important things of minimal IP. The code is available on GitHub. Uh, you can scan the QR code or you can click this uh, link or whatever. And now let's move to the code. Okay. So we have a simple project. It was created using .NET new web. This is updated template from Microsoft that uh, is known as the empty ISP.NET project. Now it generates only program CS with minimal code. It takes only four lines of code that could be reduced to three. So we build our demo on top of this thing. Let's check our program CS file. I'm using Vim. Let's go from top to, to bottom. First of all, we notice that we don't have any users here. We don't have any class, methods, and so on. And this is like the code inside the static main method from the program class. So basically we are looking inside the main method without declaring that method itself. We start from creating builder. This is common thing for ISP.NET. No changes here. We're using arcs. Arcs are ex implicitly uh, use. This is basically a command line argument. If we have any logic related on this, we can use them without de declaration. Then we use some dependency injection. We have one utility class created special for, for this demo and we will use it l later. Right now we can see that just a regular dependency injection stuff is, is going here. And we created our application using builder build. Next piece uh, of code actually creates our Redis database client. Uh, here we can see the approach to configuration for minimal APIs. So our application has a property configuration. It's an indexer. And using this indexer, we can get the configuration from anywhere. It could be either in some upsetting JSON, our custom JSON, maybe environment variables, or common line arguments, or any other configuration provider that we can plug into our application. In this case, we are trying to get the Redis host from the environment, and if it's not present, we will fall back to uh, our local localhost and the classic Redis 
port. I'm using Redis just because I can and because Redis is fast and easy to run Redis I just need one simple docker compose file uh, it contains only one service we use the latest image of Redis and it expose just default ports for the Redis. We can run it. Docker compose up D. It basically is saying that we need to run it in uh, background. And right now our Redis is working and we can develop against it. To run our application, we could use .NET run. However, I will show you more advanced uh, command, in which first we will set up the environment variable ISP.NET core URLs. And this environment variable, it specifies the, actually the URL that our service should respond to. There are different options how you can specify this URL. It could be either hard-coded or you can write some custom code. You can get it from the config, from the command line arguments. And also there are out-of-the-box ways of specifying this configuration and i think that environment variable is the best of all because uh, if you build the microservices they will run in some environment in some uh, cluster management system like kubernetes or maybe cloud or maybe whatever and each of these system has a way of specifying the environment variables and it could be reused everywhere so with just with this simple thing we don't need any modification to the code but we can, can configure and in our case our service will be available on localhost by port 4 force that's very convenient. Also, I'm using .NET Watch. .NET Watch is a command that monitors the uh, source files and when some file is changed, it will rerun the command. In this case, it will run the run command. And also, I'm providing no hot reload option. Hot reload is a new feature in .NET uh, six, I guess, or maybe even five. It works uh, in most cases nice. Basically, uh, what it does, it doesn't re recompile changes, uh, doesn't recompile the code for some changes. It get just pick them up from from the source and uh, just inject into running code. However, for minimal APIs and for top-level statements, not all changes are picked up and uh, you may find yourself trying to fight a bug that actually, uh, not a bug, but the uh, runtime didn't got your changes and it just executing the latest code. So to be safe, I just try to opt out this option and uh, in this case when the code is changed it will be rebuilt and rerun so for our demo purposes this is very convenient okay so we see that our application is up and running if we change so something it will be it should fail cool 
we undo our changes. And it's running again. Nice. Uh, I'm using Redis instance variable. I'm not injecting it into my services and I have a good reason for it. The reason is that all my endpoints uh, actually depend on the Redis. And if Redis is not running, then probably there is no any sense in running the whole service. And again, if you're running Kubernetes, for example, and the application cannot start, in this case, if the Redis is not uh, available, the application will fail. So we will uh, get some alert uh, and uh, Kubernetes will try to rerun the, the service and we can get information and notifications about our errors very early. And this will help us to find out what's going on and how to fix it. Logs will contain error message that it's not available. We can check the Redis, run it, and after that application will work as, as expected. <coughs> but also we could use uh, dependency injection and try to connect uh, on all the times. That's just uh, one option that I choose. Okay, so we're done with Redis, we're done with our application startup. Next thing is mapping our endpoints and providing routes. First, oh, I forgot to tell you what this service is all about, what it tries to implement. I decided not to do the boring to-do list, but instead create something like Instagram for single person. Basically, this is the service that allows you to upload and view photos and provide some descriptions to it. That, that's it. First endpoint is basically adding the photo information. This is just uh, adding description and later we will be able to upload the photo for, for this description. As you can see, we are trying to bind a post action to photos endpoint, and we provide a method that will be invoked when this uh, endpoint actually is called. Let's take a look at this method. We have some radius ma magic here. First, we need to find out the ID. We are using some counter, so we just add in one to the counter value and use this as a new ID for our for photos. Then we try to remove uh, everything we have for this ID. And then we are just storing the photo description as a list. And then we are returning anonymous objects having two links in it. One link is basically to the photo description itself. And the other link is uh, the URL by which the client can upload the photo to our service. To get these links, we are using the link generator. This is a utility class provided by ISP.NET. Uh, it gets injected into methods automatically. You don't need to configure dependency injection container. Uh, there are other classes like HTTP context, HTTP request and response, and a few others that are injected automatically. Basically, the, the same thing happened with the ISP.NET controllers, so no any ma magic is happening here. And link generator basically is used to generate links for different endpoints. In this case, uh, we are using the method getPath by name, 
So we should have some endpoints with names photos and endpoint with name uploads. If we go back, we, we can see that we have uh, this get endpoint named photos and this post endpoint named upload. So here we can just use this code to generate a links that could be returned to the client so client can invoke them in subsequent call. Cool. Let's move to the get photos me method. But before we do this, uh, let, let me show you how we can provide the in variables in our roots. In this case, we have the ID and we can specify its type. It will be not nullable int. So we can either call these photos providing some integer or just photos without any integers. In latter case, it should return the list of photos. And in former case, it should return the photo by ID thing. If we will try to set the not integer but string or daytime or whatever else uh, except of integer, the code will fail with the bad request. Let's go to the get photos. In this method, we are using iResult return uh, value. Why? Because we need to return either 200k with our expected response, or in case if we don't have photo with this ID, we will return not found. First, we check whether we have anything provided for ID. If we don't have anything, it means that we need to return all photos and we invoke a method get all photos. This method is straightforward. It just trying to get everything from the radius. We limit it to 10 just uh, because it's a good practice to limit the size of response and for each id we invoke the method get photo that basically just returns a single photo from the de de database let's go back to our get photos me method in case if we have id provided we are trying to invoke the get photo method with the value of id and uh, again, we have the, the key. We are reading a list of properties from the radius. We know that description basically is the first property, so it has the index zero. And we are returning our special object. It's a photo with ID derived from the photo object having only one description and it just adds the id and also we can see that we have the static method named default this is the implementation of the null object pattern and this pattern allows you not to mess with the nulls check for nulls and so on so instead of now response we will return some default value that could be used in different scenarios and you don't need to for example you, you can safely uh, show it the description without checking for for now so just just a good pattern and in this uh, code we are just getting something from the radius if there is 
anything, we will return a photo with ID, and if the, there is nothing, we will return the default. Um, that, that's it for our adding photos and get, getting photos. And maybe we need to check how it works in action. To do this, we will open a new window and we will use a curl. For example, if you want to see all photos, uh, I already created a bunch of them. We can see we have two photos here. We can use JQ to have our JSON more uh, print, <laughs> print friendly. We have two photos. We can get photo by ID. Yeah. And if we try to get photos well, 100, we see nothing. But if we uh, enable verbos output of curl, we can see that we got uh, not found response from the server because obviously we don't have the photo with the, this ID. And what about adding? Again, we use curl, post. I have some ready request. Here we have the URL, we have the verb that should be used, it will be post. We, we need to specify the content type, it should be application JSON. And we are sending some arbitrary JSON data. So let's try demo photo. Execute this command. And we see that we got back two links. One is four photos three. We can use it to get our code, uh, our, our <laughs> not code, but our uh, photo description. And also we can use upload uh, three to upload the actual photo. We will get back to it in a few minutes. Also, we can uh, notice that we have uh, I names of properties in camel case. But if we go to our photo CS, we will see that our properties are in Pascal case. And we haven't provided any configuration to do this. This all happens just uh, automatically. And th this is very, very nice because in JSON properties should be in camel, in .NET they should be in Pascal case and we have default conversion going on under the, the, the hood. Okay, the next thing is uh, upload photo. Again, we are using map post to map our route to the post action. We are using the variable for our route. It's also, again, it's ID and it's integer and it, it's required. So previously we provided the nullable so we could omit it from the request. But now it's mandatory and if ID is not provided, 
uh, it will not work, it will return some error code. And also we have the upload for photo method that will be involved. Of course you could uh, use not the method, you could use the anonymous function, so you could use la lambdas here, just uh, what is more convenient. I decided to move the logic into b bottom of the file, so first you see what actions you have and you want if you want to see details you can drill down to it and see how, how it works uh, by default minimal api does not have any support for uploading the data so you cannot use convenient iform that you can use in controllers. However, you can fall back to raw re request. That's why I added uh, as a dependency HTTP re request that provides you access to the underlying HTTP request and they can do anything you want. And also I'm injecting image format validator. Remember, in the top of our file, we got this uh, dependency injection configuration, so we just add in the, this validator as is. This is a very simple utility class that just checks uh, whether the ex extension of the file is JPEG or not. So we use this uh, v validator as a dependency and it's been injected automatically by the ISP.NET core ra runtime. And the logic is also straightforward. First, we check whether our content type is uh, what is expected. It should be multi-part form. If not, we are returning bad request. We can see that we using results class to generate different type of responses. We used it before for our get photo, I guess. Let me check. Yeah, we used the results OK and the results not found. Also, there are obviously results bad request. So if the content type is what we expected, we try to read the content. We are looking for special form named file. If uh, there is nothing there, then we are returning by the request with some message. Then it's time for our validator. We are validating our file name. And again, if it's not JPEG, we are returning bad request. And after that, we open a stream in our web request, open a stream in our local file system, and just copy one stream to another using stream copy to async. And we are returning the new anonymous object containing file name and ID and it's all is wrapped into 200 OK response. So this is very simple, just, I don't know, less than 20 lines of code and we have support for file uploads. And the last thing is basically the download photo code. It's uh, even more simpler because all we need to do is to read the, the file and send it back to the response. In this case, we don't inject any HTTP response stuff because we have uh, ready to use stream in our results and we can just return back 
some binary data with needed content type. So in this case, it will be image JPEG. Let's see it in action. First of, of all, we need to upload the file. I cannot find, oh yeah, like this. So we used three photo with ID three. Still we're using curl and we provided that we need to provide the file. Uh, F is basically command to upload the file. The name of the form will be file and uh, we need to upload the content of these sponge JPEG files that I just put into current directory. Okay, the response basically is our file name and ID3. It means that our file got uploaded. And the next thing would be to see whether our file is still there, where the, our photo. To do this, we will open browser. Just change photos download. I guess this is correct. Let, let me check. Yeah, we, we can see that we have our download photo uh, mapped to the photos download and then ID. Photos download three. And we see the image uploaded here. If you have 100, then we have page isn't currently working because we have some issue. Uh, of course, it should be improved. In this case, I guess the error is, let's check the error. Yeah, here it is. Could not find file, file not found exception. So we can clearly see what happens in the logs. And if needed, we could fix it. And probably the best way would be to return not found. Cool. The last thing I wanted to show during this demo. Okay, so if if we are doing microservices, you probably need to put some uh, instrumenting in it and uh, the required thing is ma metrics so we'd like to add some ma metrics how we can do it with minimal api to do it i choose a uh, prometheus because it de facto standard for the uh, microservices nowadays and for .NET, we have uh, Prometheus.NET package. And using this package, we can add metrics using literally one line of code. So again, I'm using a map, a map get. I uh, bind into the metrics endpoint. And I took this code from the documentation of Prometheus.NET. So it just it just should export all the metrics via this endpoint. Let's check it. Metrics. Yeah, here we are. We get a bunch of built-in metrics. If needed, of course, and we should probably add some custom metrics, but this is another story and the process of this doesn't differ from classic uh, microservices development. So nothing fancy 
is going on here. That's it. This is all the, the demo. Again, you can download it from my GitHub. You can try. And that's it for, for today. Should you have any questions or comments, please ask them. You can reach me via email, Twitter, also uh, join my Telegram channel where I post different interesting stuff, not only for .NET development, but also for DevOps and other things that are interested to me. But that's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention. See you.